Hey guys, how are you? Thanks for having me. It was great. I'm the clinical CAD-CAM director at the Department of Preventive and Restorative Sciences in the University of Pennsylvania School of Dental Medicine. So I'm in uh, Philadelphia. I had to travel a long way to, to be here, but I'm very excited always to come to Brazil as I've learned so many great concepts from many Brazilian clinicians during my formation and still nowadays. Um, so this is the dental school at UPenn and uh, basically here what we try to do is to combine clinical work with uh, research to be able to make more predictable treatment for our patients. We don't like to just uh, start using any material that we see out there in the dental shows or in any catalogs. We like to make sure that what we're putting in our patients is something safe. It's something that it's really going to help us avoid getting into problems, getting into complications. Because whether it's here in Brazil or in Philadelphia, complications are not, not nice for us as a clinical dentists, right? So um, what I do as the clinical CAPCAM director is to create protocols that are gonna work, not necessarily the amount of experience that we have. So this is one um, image of our digital design and milling center. I have the privilege to work with uh, Professor Marcus Blatz, who is uh, our department chair. Dr. Blatz uh, has led this department for more than 16 years ago. And this is how we teach dentistry. This is how we treat our patients. And this is not what we want to in three years or five years. This is what goes on a daily basis for us in the um, educational aspect. So um, what I want to share with you guys are these three main topics. I would like to share our clinical workflows. What would do we use? How do we use it? What do we use it for? I would also like to show clinical cases with these workflows for both tool supported and implant supported because we don't differentiate too much if my restoration is on a tooth or on an implant. At the end, it needs to be functional, needs to be aesthetic, needs to blend in the patient's mouth. And also, I would like to discuss the latest adhesive cementation protocols because adhesive dentistry is extremely important, not only for laminate veneers, but also for implant workflows. Whenever we are using newer types of uh, abutments that are shorter, we want to make sure that our restorations are securely as strong as possible. So we will go through these main uh, topics this afternoon with you guys. Part of our work as uh, academicians is to publish, to make sure that the information we uh, create, it's out there for everyone. If any of you wants any PDF of our work, please contact me later. I'll be happy to share you the uh, PDF files. If any of you have difficulty getting these publications from PubMed, I'll share you my Instagram or my email. You can just ask me for this and I will be happy to share that with you. So this is pretty much a chapter that we did on the current state of digital dentistry. And here, we would like to show you some of the workflows that we do in today's um, practice. So for us in the clinics, as a clinician, I need an intraoral scanner. That's the first thing, intraoral scanning is like the window for digital dentistry. I would like to make sure that all of us are good with the intraoral scanning and make sure that every time we make a digital impression, we check the quality of the impression. That's very important before we send it out to a particular laboratory that you like, to a particular design center that you like, but the quality that we send out needs always to be checked by yourself. Then nowadays we work with different design centers and milling centers. Some of the restorations we produce in-house, but many others we send out uh, for production. So I'm going to emphasize more on this workflow where we scan and we send out the digital impressions for fabrication. Before we get into the material part and the clinical cases, I would like to mention 
a few fundamental components that we believe are important to have longevity and aesthetic success with indirect restorations. And one topic are the instruments. We need to make sure that we are using instruments that help us obtain better marginal adaptation, instruments that help us control the amount of reduction so we can keep enamel, which is so important for stronger bonding. So we put together this cat cam bird block focused on a few things. One, maintain as much enamel as possible because bonding will always be better with it. Having fine diamond burrs that are going to give us a smoother surface that will also provide us with a better intaglio feed of any restoration and less stress will be distributed to the ceramic if we have preparations that flow. Of course, every material is going to be as strong as its weakest link. So we need to have designs of restoration of burst that help us work both not only on the facial occlusal but in the palatal aspect to create the concavities that are really needed. The next step that for us is extremely important is the soft tissue management. How delicate I am with the tissue, how thin, small and rounded are the instruments that I use to pack the core without causing any damage to the actual gum. Is something very important no matter how good your scanner is your dental technician your material or your bonding techniques if the gum is not healthy and in the correct position your restorations are not going to look aesthetic for the long term and then the other important factor for us is magnification we need to make sure that we use at least high magnification loops and if possible a microscope to check the quality of our preps. If we don't do that in the lab, in the software, we can magnify hundreds of times our files, our scans, and we can detect many areas that are not clean, that are not well defined. So it's a combination of instruments, of how we manage the soft tissue, and of course the magnification that when we put this together, it's going to give us better clinical outcomes. So these are some images of a study we did. And what we like to confirm here is that if we use a fine diamond burr to refine my preps that mimics the burrs that the milling machines use to create the restoration, we are going to be able to have the best marginal adaptation. So yes, and how to bond zirconia. So we published this classification of dental materials for indirect restorations. And basically we divide it in three main families. The first one are the resin matrix ceramics that would be any material that has a specific percentage of resin in it. These mill very fast, you manually polish, and we like them for inlays, for small type of restorations. Of course, we also have in the middle the silicate ceramics, which are mainly the most used materials for many years, like those spar ceramics for veneers or Lusa reinforced. And then we have the silicate ceramics that also are very commonly used worldwide because of their higher flexural strength. And of course, here on the left side, we have the oxides, which are the heavyweights. Most of them that we use now are zirconium oxide, and we will emphasize in this ones. So what about veneers? Why we teach veneers? Why we like to do a lot of porcelain laminate veneers? Because we are much more conservative, right? We maintain more healthy tooth structure and aesthetically I can help this patient obtain a confident smile without cutting too much healthy tooth structure. So everything starts with a digital wax up Make sure that it's always facially driven. Make sure that we have an ideal incisal edge position for this new digital wax up. And also make sure that this project follows the smile line to enhance the buccal corridor. So nowadays we are bombarded with 3D printing units, right? You go out here, you're gonna see a lot of 3D printing machines. I'm gonna tell you that many times the models that I see, I don't really like them. They have a lot of lines that I don't see in my patient's teeth, right? So it is important to make sure 
that we print always in a high resolution, that we make a detailed cleaning of curing and manually finish, finishing, polishing that printed model before you make your silicon index for your mock-up or your provisionals. Because if not, those lines in the printed model will be part of my mock-up and my provisionals. And that's not nice, that's not natural. We are starting to use technology actually to get worse, right? So we've got to consider this aspect. So you can see here, I have 3D printed models, I have a digital wax up, right? But I've taken my time to enhance the quality of the digital um, printed model. And then we move forward to the preparations. What is my focus? Enamel guided preparations. Why? Because bonding to enamel will always be better than bonding to dentin to follow the initial shape that we use for the digital workshop because we don't want to have any surprises. And many times the final restorations come and they are different than the initials, different than the mock-up, and we don't want those type of surprises. So here we always like to have the initial uh, proposal and have that confirmed. So nowadays we have better quality printing to create these models where we can even adapt these type of full ceramic restorations. And then with this printed model, we can work on the texture of these milled ceramic restorations to be able to then go back to the patient and do the trying. For me, the trying is a very critical point of the, of the sequence. I like to see one restoration at a time and then all of them to confirm the proximal contacts. The color, but it won't bond the veneer. This is important so the patient can confidently analyze how the veneers are looking. And that's something super helpful. So once we do the trying, then we gotta start with the adhesive cementation, right? When we use ceramics, we need to etch them with hydrofluoric acid and we need to apply a silane coupling agent because these are silica-based ceramics. We've been bonding ceramics for years and years and this is nothing new for you guys. I just like to make sure that I secure my restorations when I'm doing this process of etching and washing and silenizing to avoid any accident. And now we have this cement, which is Panavia Veneer. LC. LC means light curing. So the benefit that I see is that it gives me more working time. I have phosphoric acid for the tooth, a bonding agent, and a silane for the ceramic restoration. So if you use feldspathic ceramics, if you use lithium disilicate, you need to etch them depending on the manufacturer's recommendations, then always apply a silane and then the um, light curing resin cement in the intaglio of the restoration. Very detailed work on the tooth structure, I can have the bondings as well. So you can see here, rubber dam isolation. I'm cleaning the preparations as much as I can with intraoral air abrasion with uh, water. This is the aqua care system. Then we use the phosphoric acid to etch the enamel, apply my bonding agent afterwards, and then go ahead and do the final cementation of my restorations. It is important when we sit the restoration to assure that they are fully seated so we can light cure properly and then have a nice final outcome. So we don't use only zirconia. We don't use zirconia 100%. Now I'm gonna focus on zirconia, but I wanna show you how we use ceramics, of course, for veneers, for example. Where else? Where can I use porcelain crowns? Well, wherever I have a patient that has teeth that are not discolored. If I have an abutment tooth that is nice, natural color, I could replace these and use normal ceramics. Why? Because I can bond to them and I can solve this property. Whenever I have restorations before that are very invasive on the soft tissue that have created recessions that have damaged the soft tissues, I need to go slower. I need to create a nice set of meal provisional restorations that I'm going to meal and polish and then 
Once I have this, I will insert and I will wait. Here I'm gonna wait this with provisionals six weeks. Why? Because the design of the previous restorations was pushing up the papillas, was creating recessions. I want the body to try to start to heal, promoting that natural healing with a new set of provisionals that are slightly under contour to create space for these soft tissues. I'm gonna cement this with a temporary cement and then I'm going to have my measurements to track and see if we are getting better regarding on the position of the soft tissue around my restoration. He started to use zirconium oxide as a framework material. This first generation of zirconia that has a 3% of yttria, as you can see here, 3Y is the strongest zirconia type with the highest mechanical properties, is very opaque and it's used to receive zirconia on top. Instead of porcelain infused to metal, we started working with porcelain infused to zirconia restorations. What could happen? Chipping of the ceramic on top if we don't know how to handle the material properly. So someone said, well, let's make a type of material that is bulletproof. And industry started to modify the amount of yttria, and then we came up with a 4% zirconia. And this is the zirconia that we use for monolithic restorations. Monolithic, when I only have one layer, right? The entire restoration is made of one layer. What's the benefit? No chipping, less uh, material thickness is required, and we can be less invasive in our preparations as well. So this is the zirconia type that it's in the middle. It's not the strongest, it's not the most aesthetic, but we use it a lot because it combines, let's say, the best of both worlds. And then industry came up with what we call cubic zirconia. Cubic zirconia has 5% of yttria or more. It is the most translucent, but it will be the weakest also. So we started working back in 2017, testing the Katana SD, super translucent zirconia that basically has 4% of yttria. When we go to our biomaterials lab and do the testing, here you can see in yellow, the I'm sorry, in uh, red, the Katana STML having around 700 megapascals of flexural strength. As I said, less yttria, more strength. And the UTML, which has 5% of yttria, would be the cubic zirconia, is weaker, right? We can see here in yellow around 550 megapascals. When we compare to lithium disilicate, is still significantly more stronger, way more stronger. So whenever we have situations in the mouth that we cannot do a very good bonding cementation, or we have heavy brooks or patients that have already got fractures on traditional ceramics, I think this has a reason to be there. I think you should be knowledge about these materials for the benefit of your patients. So it doesn't matter that this um, zirconia is that strong, we still need to prep in a way that we maintain certain guidelines. So for monolithic zirconias we're with 4 and 5% of yttria, for anterior crowns we need to have 0.8 millimeters thickness. This is necessary, but 0.8 millimeters is not such an aggressive reduction that is needed. When we go to the posteriors, one millimeter would be the needed reduction for these restorations to work properly also in the posterior region. Am I using zirconia for inlays? Of course not. Why? Because in an inlay, I'm replacing mostly dentin. I want to have a material that it's more elastic when I'm replacing dentin, right? Because that's the model of elasticity that dentin has. So for replacement of dentin, I like to use composite. But for replacement of enamel, having this material is always a great idea. And these images shows us how I should not prep. I would make sure that I don't have very sharp sharp incisal edges. I want to avoid having um, very abrupt steps on my finish line. I want to make sure I don't have rough margin. That's what I started talking about the burrs, talking about the um, loop, because those are key elements to be able to be successful with monolithic zirconia restorations. So in 2020, we started publishing 
our work using this type of monolithic zirconia restorations in the QDT 2020. And this is a case to endodontically treat a teeth. I am scanning, I'm designing, and I'm gonna use Katana Zirconia STML, super translucent multi-layer with 4% of yttria. So I can design, mill, and I can also speed sinter this type of zirconia. So this can be sintered even faster than a lithium disilicate. So now it starts to become more attractive because the production is also something very quick. So let's take a look on these type of zirconias. What is the aesthetic benefit? They are polychromatic. They have more dentin, body dentin layer in the bottom. And as they go up, we have more translucency. So the restoration comes out and it's already multi-chromatic. I don't need to paint all that. It already comes from the inside. The color is intrinsic. So it will be maintained for a longer period of time. So I do the restorations, glaze them, and this is the final result. We started to use zirconia and we started to say, this looks pretty nice. This might be also a nice alternative to what we have been using for the last years. So let's go back and th think about tooth structure, right? The enamel is very stiff, very rigid, while the dentin is much more elastic. That's why we don't recommend to use zirconia to replace big chunks of dentin. We want to use zirconia to replace the stiff part of the tooth, which is the enamel. So what about these type of situations? Who likes to restore maxillary second molars? Sometimes they are difficult. Sometimes we don't have space. Sometimes the patient is a heavy broxer and has already fractured something, right? Okay, so I think that for these situations, monolithic zirconia is a good alternative. Look this case, patient came with a provisional. Patient was not happy with the provisional from where he was being treated. That's why it's important for us to always keep this in mind and invest in the provisionals. Provisional was falling out, patient came to the university. I removed the provisional and I need to do a crown because the tooth has already been prepared, right? So what I want, I want to maintain the height of the prep, but I don't have too much space. I wanna use a material that is strong and I can use it in a thinner um, thickness in that occlusal portion. So this is a Katana STML crown with 4% of yttria at a thickness of one millimeter. I think that the morphology that can be achieved is really nice while still being a very strong material for that situation. Something that I really like about zirconia is the marginal adaptation. Why? Because when zirconia crowns are being milled, they are always milled 20 to 25% bigger because they go through a process called sintering. And when the crown is sintering the porcelain furnace, 